with them afraid. And let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, again, we thank you for those who are here tonight. And Lord, we thank you for the privilege of being able to meet together here on the first day of this new year. And I pray that uh, we would all have a desire in our heart to start off this year right. And Lord, we've already begun that by being here in your house. And I thank you for it. Speak to our hearts, I pray now, from your word. And Lord, help us to learn, help us to understand. And Lord, help us to apply what your word teaches, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you. You may be seated. Now, <clears throat> Zephaniah is called the royal prophet because there are those who assume that he is related to King Hezekiah. We talked about that uh, last week. Zephaniah uh, began his ministry during the reign of King Josiah. And remember, we've talked about this with several of the prophets. Josiah was the, the last king, really, to make any attempt to bring about a national revival. And yet, as you read through the book of Zephaniah, it's as if none of that's going on. Uh, and we'll, we've talked about that at one time or another, and we'll probably talk about it some more before we're all through. Uh, but... Uh, Zephaniah, he's really talking to people as they were, not as they seem to be. That's, that's what he's doing. And uh, we talked last week about the determination of the Lord. And of course, we saw the, the prophet's pedigree, but we also saw his perspective. At least we began to look at his perspective uh, as he talked about the decision of the Lord in regards to the people of God. Uh, because everywhere he turned, he saw the destruction that was about to come on the nation of Judah because of the sin that was unrepentant of. Uh, and so he saw that. You know, <clears throat> I, I, can, I can understand that perception uh, to some degree. Uh, not that I'm a prophet and I can see the future and I can see what's going to happen. But sometimes you can see people make decisions and you can see where that's about to lead. It's not that God's giving you visions of the future and, and prophecy and so on. It's that, you know, you can see that what they're doing is the cause and you know what the effect's going to be. You know, you've lived life long enough and you've had enough experience. You see, this is what's going to happen. They're going down this road and this is going to be the outcome. And that's kind of what's going on with Zephaniah. He sees what's going on, and he can see down the road, here's what's going to be the outcome of that. And I tell you, that can be discouraging for the man of God. Because uh, the man of God, as we talked about Sunday, gives his heart and he gives his life to draw people close to God. But when he sees that even though he pours his heart out uh, time after time, people continue to make these crazy decisions that lead all the wrong ways. And it's heartbreaking and it's discouraging and you feel like, is nobody listening? Sort of like Isaiah said, Lord, who has believed our report? And what he's saying is, Lord, I've been faithful, and I've said exactly what you told me to say, and I've done exactly what you told me to do, and nobody listens. They keep making the same mistakes, they keep making the same bad decisions, and they keep thinking it's going to turn out different. And it's not. We know it never turns out right to disobey God. It never does. And so... Uh, that, that's really what Zephaniah is seeing uh, here. And, and we saw the discrimination of the Lord. At least we started talking about that, talking about that idolatrous prophet. And uh, we talked about uh, the fact that it, it, it seems that many of these prophets were black. In other words, they're, they're dressing in such a way that they would look different from the priests of God. And uh, there ought to be a difference between the man of God, the, the, the messengers of God, and, and those who aren't. There ought to be a difference. Uh, and, and, and again, we, we dealt with that, but now we want to pick up talking about 
Judah's idolatrous practices. Their practices. So not just the priests. Remember the priests, they were going around trying to drum up business, as it were. They're trying to get people to, you know, join in with us. If you join in with us, sort of like uh, the generic church. You heard about the generic church, right? You know, it's sort of like uh, the no-name brand church. Uh, and I can't really say no-name brand here because there really is a no-name brand. Um, in the U.S., there's not, so I can get away with that. But, uh, you know, generic brand, that's an off-brand. It's not your name brand. And, uh, and I heard about this guy. He said, we're a generic church. You only have to tithe 9% with us. Uh, <laughs> and so, you know, there's some people that they, they do things like that. Uh, you know, hey, come to our church and we'll do this for you. We'll do that for you. Uh, sort of like uh, different times that I've had people call me up and they'll say, uh, you know, what, what does your church have to offer? Now, I don't have that so much now, uh, but other places I've been. What does your church have to offer? What programs do you have for our kids? Well, let's see. And I love, I heard one, one old preacher talk about this. He said, well, we've got Sunday morning preaching where you hear from the Word of God. And then in the evening we have Sunday night preaching where you hear from the Word of God. And then in the middle of the week we have our midweek uh, prayer and Bible study where you hear from the Word of God, because it doesn't matter if you're young or old, that's what we need. What we need is not to be played with. We don't need fun and games, and I'm not opposed to fun and games. I, I mean, you, you ought to know that by now. Um, but I'm not opposed to fun and games. However, when we're talking about what church is all about, it's not fun and games. It is a very serious task that God has given us. And so we're not going to play games. But anyway, but that's what they do. Uh, these idolatrous priests, they run around, hey, come to our church because we have more fun than the other churches. And of course, we're told over and over again, well, that's why the young people are leaving uh, Bible-believing churches because nobody plays with them. I'll be honest with you. Do you know why? Well, I, I, I'm not going to go down that road. Because <laughs> that I would, I would not even come back if I went down that road. Um, but I'll, I'll tell you one reason why that children end up leaving Bible-believing churches is because it's not real at home. And that's true. It's not real at home. It's fake. It's all fake. It's put on when they come to church. And so, so the kids say, I don't need that. Secondly, one, another reason why people, uh, young people leave Bible-believing churches is because they do play with them too much. They emphasize the activities and they emphasize the fun. And you know what? The world can out-fun any church. And so they get old enough and they realize, hey, there's more fun out there. And off they go. I'm not kidding. That, that's two reasons, and I'm not going to go down any more reasons, but that's two of them. But when we get here to verses 5 and 6 of Zephaniah chapter 1, you find Judah's idolatrous practices. Verse 5, And them that worship the host of heaven upon the housetops, and them that worship and that swear by the Lord and that swear by Malcolm, and them that are turned back from the Lord, and those that have not sought the Lord, nor inquired of him. So Zephaniah saw many people worshiping the sun, moon, and stars on their rooftops, on the tops of their houses. Look over in Jeremiah chapter 7, and verse number 18. Jeremiah 7, and verse 18. Remember, Jeremiah would have been... Um, I mean, his ministry was along a similar timeline as that of Zephaniah. And so we see here in Jeremiah chapter 7, verse 18. He says, The children gather wood, and the fathers kindle the fire, and the women knead their dough to make cakes to the queen of heaven, and to pour out drink offerings unto other gods, that they may provoke me to anger. This is what's going on. Jeremiah talks about it. Zephaniah talks about it. They knew it was going on. They saw it. And, you, you know, it, it, it doesn't take, uh, it doesn't take much to see that even here in our city, there's idolatry all over the place. 
uh, in our city of one, one sort or another. Uh, even those who follow after astrology today, you know, they're guilty of worshiping, that is, making themselves subject to the stars, aren't they? And I would warn every one of you against looking up your horoscope. I would warn you against that, because that is nothing more than uh, devil worship. So, it, and, and I know people say, well, you know, I don't really believe in it. I just look because it's fun. And that's how it always starts. So we would be better off not to even start. But here, not only are, does, does uh, Zephaniah see these people on their rooftops worshiping the sun, moon, and stars, but he also hears these same people swearing in the name of the Lord. Oh, wait a minute. They're worshiping the sun, moon, and stars, the, the host of heaven. And then they turn right around and, oh, yeah, well, I, I'm a Christian. Oh, I believe in Jesus. How many people are like that? You know, and, and they're involved in things uh, that, that really have to do with astrology and, and the worship of different things, false gods and so on. And they'll say, well, but wait a minute, I'm a Christian. There's nothing really wrong with that. And there's some things I'm thinking about. I'm not going to bring them up right now. But there are a lot of things you could talk about. Here's what the Bible tells us about swearing, making oaths. The Bible tells us that's not a legitimate activity for a believer. Oh, well, by whatever. Because that's what people say, right? They'll say, by God, they say, by this, by that. You know what that is. That's, you're making an oath is what you're doing. Uh, and and uh, that, that's not the Christian's business. James 5 and verse 12, But above all things, my brethren, swear not, neither by heaven, neither by the earth, neither by any other oath. Oh, I swear on my mother's grave. Well, you know, hey, I swear by my children's lives. I've heard that over and over and over from, from a lot of different people. That's not what the Christian's supposed to do. You know what the Christian's supposed to do? The Christian, first of all, is supposed to be honest. So if the Christian's honest, they don't have to swear by their children's lives or by their mother's grave or this or that. They don't have to because they're honest. And that's really part of what he's saying here. Um, and so, again, let's, let's finish that up. But let, uh, let your yea be yea and your nay nay unless you fall into condemnation. So, yes or no? It's not, well, I, I promise with my hand up. No, no. It's either yes or it's no. It's not all this other stuff to prove that I'm telling the truth. It's either yes or no. And look, if you can't be trusted, that's your fault. And that's you making yourself a poor testimony for God. And you promising with your hand up is not going to make it any better. It's not going to help it. But that's part of what's going on. And, and really, when you think about it, that's utter hypocrisy that, that's going on here. They're on the one hand, they're not even worshiping the Lord, they're worshiping the host of heaven. But when it comes to something serious, oh, I promise, you know, you know, I, I mean, I, just before God, I'm telling the truth. You see what I'm saying? It's so hypocritical. It's like you don't even you don't even act like you believe in God. But then when something's serious, then oh hey, I'm gonna call on the name of God. If that's not taking the name of the Lord in vain. And of course, that is one aspect of it. But Zephaniah also saw that these people were swearing by Malcolm just as easily as they would swear by the Lord. Isn't that what people do today? Oh, I, you, know, you know, I swear by, by God or I swear by Allah. You know, it's all the same anyway. And yet it's not. It's not. Uh, and, and again, we could go down that road quite a bit as well. But these were supposed to be the people of God. And yet, they're just as easy to swear by the name of a false god as they are Jehovah. 
It's as if they couldn't tell the difference. And that's a bad place to be when you can't even tell the difference between right and wrong and uh, between truth and error. Over in the book of Malachi chapter 3, Malachi chapter 3, verse number 18. And this is talking about the last days. Uh, <clears throat> and this, this will be a good time. Uh, but it, it really serves in contrast to what we're talking about here. Malachi 3.18 Then shall ye return and discern between the righteous and the wicked. Between him that serveth God and him that serveth him not. You'll be able to tell between right and wrong. You'll be able to tell between truth and error. They couldn't tell. Oh yeah, hey, we're God's people. But I tell you by Malcolm, which is a false god, we'll talk about in a little bit here in a second. But they say, okay, you know, I, I promise by Malcolm that, that I'm telling you what's right. I'm telling you the truth. And then turn around, hey, I'm a good Christian. Really? No, I don't think so. It, it doesn't work that way. Uh, and we'll talk about that more as we get into um, uh, some of the other prophets. I think when we get into Haggai, we'll talk about that a little bit more. Uh, but anyway, Malcolm is also called Milcom, Molak, or Molak. All, it's, it, all, all those ways, all those different names are used throughout the scripture talking about the same deity. Malcolm is the national god of the Ammonites. And the chief form of worship for Malcolm was by offering live children in the fire. Uh, what would happen is uh, the idol would be made of rock or made of metal sometimes and the belly of the idol they would build a fire in the belly of the idol so they would heat up the metal and the arms were always outstretched and what they would do is they take those live babies and lay them on the arms of the idol and I cannot imagine a more horrible thing to do and say I'm worshiping a God than that. It's just an awful thing. But God told them, even before they got into the promised land, God told Israel, you are not to worship this God. Mm -hmm. Look back over in the book of Leviticus chapter 18. Leviticus chapter 18 and verse 21 says, and thou shalt not let any of thy seed pass through the fire to Molech. Neither shalt thou profane the name of thy God. I am the Lord. It's interesting that God puts those two things together. Don't profane the name of God. And don't, you know, offer your children to Molech. Because they were named after the name of God. Israel means a prince with God. They're, they're, the very name of their nation was the name of God. And yet, for them to go and worship Molech, they are profaning the very name of God by saying, hey, we're named after God. Let's go offer up our children to this idol over here. Look in chapter 20, Leviticus chapter 20, verse 2. Again, thou shalt say to the children of Israel, whosoever he be of the children of Israel, or of the strangers that sojourn in Israel, that giveth any of his seed unto Molech, he shall surely be put to death. The people of the land shall stone him with stones. And I will set my face against that man and will cut him off from among his people because he hath given his seed unto Molech to defile my sanctuary and to profane my holy name. And if the people of the land do anyways hide their eyes from the man when he giveth his seed unto Molech and kill him not, then I will set my face against that man and against his family and will cut him off and all that go a-whoring after him to commit whoredom with Molech from among their people. God made it very clear. And yet, here they are, not just worshiping him, but they feel very comfortable in using the name of Molech interchangeably with the name of God. What a horrible, horrible position they're in. And uh, anyway... 
You say, that, that's just awful that it's that way. And it's interesting as you read the Bible, and we'll see this more, especially I, I'm thinking when we get to 1 Corinthians and Galatians, but it's, it's in, in different places throughout Scripture where God puts things together that don't seem like they go together. God puts things together, and part of that list of things we say, that is horrible, like this that we're talking about right now. That's absolutely outrageous that they would call on the name of Molech as, you know, just like it was the Lord. It's outrageous that they would serve that God. It's outrageous that they would do that. And yet, God put some other things in with that list that we look at and we say, well, that's not so bad. It's interesting. Look, look here in verse number 6. Because it says, And them that are turned back from the Lord, and those that have not sought the Lord, nor inquired for Him. And it seems as bad, does it? That doesn't seem as bad as somebody that would offer their children to an idol. In our way of thinking. But see, that's because we don't see things from God's perspective. All too often. We see it from our own perspective. From how we think things ought to be. Rather than how they really are. See, when God tells us something, God's telling us the truth. God's not... You know... God doesn't have to play it up to make it look worse than it really is. When God tells us something in His Word, it's not for us to say, well, yeah, you know, that was, you know, in that time, that was a bad thing, but it's really not that big a deal now. God never changed His mind. But again, He's talking about worshiping the host of heaven. He's talking about uh, uh, swearing uh, an oath in the name of the Lord and then swearing an oath in the name of, of Malcolm. And then it throws in these things. Those who simply turn back from God. Is that the same? In our mind, do we equate those? Or do we say, oh, no, 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 that's much less bad. I mean, yeah, it's probably not a good idea, but that's not near as bad as death. How often, and I'm, I'm talking to us as God's people, how often do we minimize sin in our life? And we say, well, that's not really that big a deal. That's really not that important. That's really not that bad. And yet when God puts it together in the list, he doesn't seem to make any difference at all. What should we learn from that? What we need to learn is that we should never, ever excuse our sin. We should never say, well, this is really not that big a deal. I mean, yeah, it's maybe not the best way. Maybe it's not right. It's not that bad. We should never do that because God doesn't do that. So he talks about those who simply turn back from the Lord. He talks about those who fail to purposely seek the Lord. Now we've talked about this before, haven't we? The idea of setting your heart or purposing in your heart like Daniel did to seek the Lord. And, and you find that again throughout uh, 1 Second Samuel, 1 Second Kings, 1 Second Chronicles, where it talks about the different kings, and it says some of them, even though they did right things, they still did wrong because they didn't set their heart to seek the Lord. And so that's another thing. So they may be doing the right things on the outside, but because they're not doing it on purpose to, to do what is pleasing to God, God's not happy with that. And then also those who fail uh, to find direction from the Lord. Well, that's not that big a deal, is it? We, we I mean, we've just started a new year. And there are things that are going to come in, in all of our lives where we have to make a decision. What am I going to do? Am I going to go this way? Am I going to go this way? Am I, am I going to decide yes? Am I going to decide no? When, you know, we have decisions to make. Now, when we have those decisions to make, are we going to seek for direction from the Lord? Are we going to say, well, what, uh, how is this going to best suit me? How will this best benefit 
my bank account? How will this best convenience my life? Because those are extremely selfish motivations and considerations. And God's not in that. And so there are God's people all the time. They're making decisions left and right. I'm going to do this. I'm going to do this. I'm going to do this. I'm going to do that. And they go out and do those things. And they never once think, is this what God wants me to do? Is this God's will for me? They never think that. They never pray about it. They never ask for counsel. They never ask for godly advice. No. They just go do it. And then... Their, their spiritual life shrivels and dries up because they made a decision based on what best suits me and what best fits me and what is most comfortable and convenient for me instead of asking God what He wants. And I tell you what's so sad is that many times these Christians are like Samson. They shriveled up spiritually. Their fellowship with God is broken. And their power from God is gone. And they don't even recognize it. They still think they're a great Christian. They still think they're, they're a spiritual powerhouse, as it were. And they're not. They're dried up. They're just a shell of what they used to be. And they're very easily led astray by the devil. And God says these people are just as bad as those who are worshiping the host of heaven. Think about that. If God puts that much importance on it, how much importance should you be putting on going to God with every decision that you have to make instead of, hey, I'll just do this. It's easy to do. Just make a decision. Just do something. But we need God's direction. You see, the Bible tells us that the steps of a good man are ordered by the Lord. But you know what that does not mean? That does not mean that whatever decision I choose to make, that's the direction God wanted me to go in. That's not what that means. That means that God has a planned purpose path for each one of us to follow. God has a decision for each one of us to make for every decision. He has the answer for every one of those. And it's not just whatever we happen to decide. It's His will, not ours. And we have to recognize that. We have to surrender to that. And we have to seek God's direction. God, I know you've ordered my steps. But tell me, where do they go? Have you ever been out walking in the middle of the night, like out in the field? When, when we were in Papua New Guinea, I was, I was talking to the boys about this the other day. <clears throat> Our truck got stuck in the road. And we ended up, and, and it got dark, it was raining. We had to walk three, four kilometers to. Um, to where, where we spent the night. And you couldn't see. There's no street lights. We didn't have a flashlight. And somebody somebody had a kerosene lantern, but they were like a million uh, kilometers ahead of us, it felt like. Uh, they weren't with us. You couldn't see where you were stepping. Yeah, we're in the road, but the, the road was mud. And uh, oh, it was it was so sloppy. It was such a mess. You couldn't see where you were going. And every time you try and put your foot down, you think, okay, this is going to be solid ground. No, it's light out from under you. And so you're slipping and sliding the whole way. That's how it is when we try to make our own decisions instead of asking the Lord, where do you want me to go? What decision do you want me to make? Just, 
just like the Apostle Paul, the very first thing out of his mouth when he met the Lord, uh, the first thing he says, who art thou, Lord? But you remember what the very next thing is? Lord, what will thou have me to do? And do you remember the Lord's response? Go into the city and it will be told thee what thou must do. You didn't go into the city running around. Well, I think I'll do this. I think I'll do that. I think I'm going to do that. I think I'm going to do some of this. And I think this would be a good thing. He didn't do that. He stopped. Of course, he couldn't see. But he waited until he got direction before he did anything. How many times are we guilty of, I've got to make a decision. I've got to make one right now. And we don't stop. And we don't seek for direction from the Lord. And what I'm saying is, we've all been guilty of that. And according to what we read here in Zephaniah, we're just in the same boat as those that worship the host of heaven. So I think we need to get down off our high horse and, and stop thinking of ourselves as these spiritual giants because we're not spiritual giants. We need the Lord. Let me tell you something. Even as you grow in the Lord, you don't grow out of your need for God. As you grow in the Lord, you know what you realize? You realize, I need the Lord more. It's, you, you never get to the point of, well, you know, I can make this decision because, you know, I, I've walked with the Lord all these years. I can make this decision. No, you can't. The more you walk with the Lord and the closer you get to God, the more you realize there is no decision that you have to make that you can make for yourself without going to God first. Not one. And we need, to, that's something we need to learn. So what, what we find here is that a failure to wholeheartedly serve the Lord is just as bad as worshiping a false God. And here's why. Because the heart's love and loyalty has wandered away from the Lord. That's why. When you're not seeking the Lord's direction in every decision that you make, where's your loyalty? The loyalty is to yourself rather than to the Lord. Right? When you're not seeking the Lord's direction for every decision you make, whose will is it you're following? Your own. Not God's will. You're following your own. This is important for us to grasp. Here we are coming into a new year, clean slate, right? So we can, we can uh, start over on some of the things that last year maybe we failed at. And I'm glad God gives us new opportunities to turn around and make things right and do things the right way. I'm glad God's that way with us and for us. But uh, this is certainly where we need to start. We shouldn't say, well, you know, I'm not, I'm not out worshiping all these false gods, so I'm okay. Don't go down that road. Because God put on the same level simply turning back from God. How are you in your relationship with God today as compared to January 1st, 2018? Are you closer to the Lord today than you were? I'm not asking are you farther away. I'm asking are you closer to the Lord today than you were last year on January 1st? I'll tell you this, if you're not closer to the Lord today, you are farther from the Lord. Because you don't just sit still. That's not how it works. So, ask yourself this, are you purposefully, purposely seeking God? Or does God have to slap you in the face to get your attention? <coughs> We've had examples of that. We talked about Jonah. We've talked about others that God has essentially had to grab and shake to try and get their attention. Is that the way that God's had to deal with you? Or are you purposely seeking Him? 
Are you seeking His direction in every decision that you make or just in the big ones, whatever those are? Sort of like the guy that said, you know, I, I go to God, uh, you know, I go to God with all the big decisions in life, but so far there haven't been any. But sometimes that's how we are with God. We pretend like, God, you're the God of all the big things. But the little things, I'll take care of that. So let me ask you, compared to last year, are you seeking for God's direction more today than you were last year at this time, or not? And if you say, well, I don't think so, or whatever terminology you want to use, then you're further from God than you were last year at this time. And it's time for you to turn around. It's time for you to make some changes. Because as far as God's concerned, you're not any different than an idolater. God wants you to be different. Just like we've talked about in our Sunday afternoon series, designed to be different. God wants you to be different. And so in these three areas, we've got to search our own hearts. Where am I? Maybe I'm not out living in sin, living in terrible sin, but am I really following the Lord? Or am I just following myself and trying to hang a Christian facade on the front of that. You ought to help us. Let's stand together with our heads bowed and eyes closed.